<laughs> wow. <laughs> Main PCM power. That's a mistake. It's wiggly giggly. Mabel? That's a mess. Oh my gosh. For road trip. Georgia state line. I'm a pushover. <laughs> <laughs> Fatty beat on there. What is your deal? <laughs> Quit. <laughs> this was a train wreck. Completely melted off the deal. Rocky wants to help. Never came back alive. All the secrets here. Mystery solved. Word. Cost you a whole paycheck. Your main grounds for PCM is leaking? This is an unfortunate event. <laughs> I hope I hear the Souths are down now. <laughs> main wire. High flower. That's terrifying. Jesus, take the wheel. Seaguar. Words. We're already all up in it. Dirt Dauber's nest. Oh, wow. Mystery solved. All that was holding it. Seaguar. They were later to mom. Can I throw it? Woo! <laughs> he did it. Can what? Oh, he's attacking me. What? Back up, Ralphie. <laughs> oh, I don't see no fire. No. Yes, yeah, sir. What's the worst thing that could happen? That's right. I think. Maybe. Oh, my gosh. Mm. <gasps> Oh my gosh! It's mind boggling. Cause it's tough. But I want to push it. Looks it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh lord. I'll make a great team. Have you been eating the Hanes manual? Oh yeah. <laughs> mm, certainly. Oh great. We made the right choice. Word. Right here. The cat had it. It ain't gonna work for long. That's incredible. Wow. That doesn't even make sense. I couldn't help myself. The scary part is done now. Not cheap at all. Oh, wow. Woo! Running on fumes. Hey, we're good. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> Keep it coming. We're there. We don't need no tail lights. Guys, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> at least we got that on video. <laughs> you show up late for work, that's what happens, bro. Welcome back to the Sleep For Dude YouTube channel. We are in the midst of a 5.9 Magnum swap in our 74 Dodge B300 van. We've done a full renovation of the inside of this van that you guys have probably seen. We're trying to take a big trip this summer in this thing and we're trying to get it done in time. We're running out of days. The kids are already out of school. We're down to the wire. We're trying to get it done. But this journey started two days ago. This is after two days of work of me and Ralphie and Wawa going through the harness, pulling it out of the Durango, pulling the transmission out of the Durango, tracing every wire down, going through the Haynes manual and the wiring diagrams line by line because there's no information out there. If you're trying to do a 5.9 Magnum swap, it's unreal that there's not really any information I can find out there on how to wire this. So I'm gonna try to solve that mystery for some of you guys. So we're starting out with a 99 Dodge Durango PCM here, which I would have assumed went just for the engine, but no, it goes through the entire car. So it's the whole powertrain control module. It goes up under the dash. So basically we took it loose under the dash at this big main plug. There was a couple other smaller plugs. And now we've got to the point where we cut all that off. So this is the harness from the firewall forward. And I'm gonna show you guys how to wire it in and how to fire it up. And hopefully this works. This is my first 5.9 Magnum swap, so I'm learning with you guys. And hopefully we can learn together and we can get the information out there that everybody needs to do a swap like this. So let's rewind back to two days ago and show you us going through this harness and trying to figure all this out. Woo! Transmission's out, Ralphie. Woo! <laughs> I didn't know that was happening. <laughs> That's great. So after hours and hours and hours today tracing and unplugging wires, I didn't cut a single wire yet. And I think I've got the whole harness out of this thing. So I've got to cut a bunch out of this harness, looks like. I really don't know what's required for this to run. Hopefully this won't whip me. Look at the size of that plug, Ralphie. All right. There we go. It's out. Look at this beast. That's the harness. Wow. Can you believe that? I didn't expect it to be that big. I've done a few different EFI swaps before, and I've never started with a harness that was this big. Yeah. All right, let's figure this out. I guess I'm going to spend the foreseeable future cutting through this harness. I'm going to unwrap the whole thing, trace every wire.
one eternity later. Eight seconds. This ain't no bull riding, son. See this little Vaughn. He's gonna. Oh, here, come on. Please run. But his feet are on the ground still. <laughs> Now it's two days later, we went through all that. Let me show you some of the basics of wiring this thing according to the Haynes manual that we got on this. So this is very specific, it's for a 98 to 99 Durango, but I'm sure a, a Ram or whatever would be very similar. So if you get in the back here, it says PCM power, which PCM is the computer that runs the engine. Plug C1. So these plugs here on the computer are labeled C1, C2, and C3. It tells you right there, C1, pin number two. So pin number two gets power on the start and the run. So that means when you're cranking the engine over and when it's on the on position. So that's important to have power in both those positions. Then pin 22 gets power all the time. And these wires are light green and black on the start run one. And this one is red with a white stripe on the constant power. And then pin 31 and 32 are both black wires and they get grounded. So that's your main PCM power right there. So that's one of the main things you have to do. Now there's plenty of other wires you have to hook up for your fuel pump and things like that. But that is the basis of what you need to get this thing to power up and for the engine to start and run. But let's get into the details of it. Let's see if we can make this wiring harness fit in our van. Wawa's really wondering where we're gonna put all this and I kinda <laughs> am too. But uh, the part that's not de-loomed yet is the part that goes on the engine. So we'll start with plugging that stuff in and start to route these wires around. We even kept the fuse box off of the Durango because our fuse box in this is actually melted. I'll show you in just a second. So we're probably gonna try to use the factory Durango fuse box for the most part. But you can see this is your air condition relay. This is your transmission relay, fuel pump relay. And this is the relay that basically kills the engine when you shut the key off. All right, let's get to it guys. I don't know exactly where we're gonna mount any of this yet, but I guess the length of this harness is kinda gonna dictate that. Cause this was on the passenger firewall up under the hood, which this thing don't really have under the hood. It, the hood is like this long. So let's kinda keep it that way. Maybe that'll help us. Why don't you move that over towards mom more? We labeled every wire as we unhooked them. So hopefully we won't have any trouble finding this. I, I see a lot of guys, they blow stuff apart and they don't label it. And that's a mistake, especially if you're doing something new in depth so this is our transmission plug let's see which side of the engine is this guys manifold air tent okay we'll start there so this goes right down this side of the engine so here's our manifold air temp and then this goes to our alternator right here which i'm excited about having a modern alternator on this thing the alternator on the old engine was about to fall off of it the brackets were all broke this is our water temp which is right down in this hole. We put a new water temp sensor in this in the last video if you watched it, because the old one was wiggly giggly. There we go. And then it's just as simple as plugging in our injectors down through here. We even labeled which ones they were. We probably didn't even have to. Mabel, are you wanting to get in the motorhome? <laughs> She's like, yep. Yeah. Come on, baby. Oh, we're not making a mess in my motorhome now. Don't be making a mess. Don't eat the wires, Mabel. <laughs> it's okay. And guys, don't be overwhelmed by this wiring. It's easy for people such as my wife to get overwhelmed with wiring. But you really have to look at it one wire at a time, one plug at a time, however you want to look at it, and you will get through it. Because I've been through a bunch of these or like this. It can be overwhelming, but it's all in how you look at it. You just trace one wire at a time, and you'll eventually have the whole thing figured out. Squeezy's already checked out. <laughs> she don't want in no wiring today. So this goes around this side of the engine. What's that green wire? Oh, it doesn't oh, hook to anything. Oh, he okay. just ran though. I don't know where he came from. So this should go around to that bank of the engine. I've kind of got it tangled up from two days of messing with it. This is a mess. It's gonna all work out. Don't worry. Are you still shot, Dakota? Shh, 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 shh. Crank sensor. So here's your crank sensor. It goes into the bell housing of the transmission. So this plugs in right here to our new sensor. She's looking at the mirror. Oh gosh, the goat's looking in the mirror. <laughs> she found a goatie? How many times have our goats done that lately? Oh, all the time. Here is our throttle position sensor. There's our idle air control. There's yeah. one right under the back of that thing. Oh, right, that's our manifold air pressure right there. Okay, you got that one. So that goes up under oh, here. Dinner, Good dinner. job, mom. Finally found that one. AC clutch. 
So that is right up here. And we plan on doing the AC as well. So right here is our high side air conditioning switch. So we have a new condenser and we have a universal AC line kit that's coming in the mail as well. <coughs> what do you, why are you wanting to eat it? You're not being a good goat helper today. So here is injector five, injector seven. Here's our other two injectors. She's trying to help you. She's so helpful. Thank you, thank you. I just really like engine swaps. That's really the basics of what plugs into the engine right there. So what you have is this main plug here goes to the, what do they call this? Power distribution module, I believe is what they call this, but it's basically the fuse block. Oh my gosh. This is gonna go out towards our battery. She um, ain't got much room to go out there, does she? No, it's tight fit. Pull that out your way. Gently. And it needs to go over towards the battery. The what? The battery. You're just snuggling right in there. You, you. You're about to go out in the field, what you're about oh, to do. I, just... I think it's going to go a little bit more there. We should be able to put the fuse box here okay. and the battery right there. I'm trying to find groups of wires that go the same direction here. And I'm just going to put like a zip tie every foot or so. And that way it's not such a mess to deal with. And this is our main plug down to our transmission. This is our main powertrain control module plugs. We know nothing's going to change on this end. So we're just going to go ahead and zip tie them every little bit as well. You can use electrical tape, honestly. The only reason I'm using this is I couldn't find my electrical tape. So we just got started on this and the place is cutting down a drive shaft just called and said it's ready to come pick up. So we want to get down there and get it. So we're going to head down there and get that real quick and we'll get right back on this. Y'all ready for road trip? Yeah. We got about an hour drive. Mom's driving, so that's probably 30 minutes. 38 minutes, here we go. Thankfully I'm navigating, so we're good. So you guys like being off for the summer? Yep. Yeah. Not having to go to school every day? Yep. This is the stuff me and mom do all the time when y'all are at school. <laughs> go and get parts and stuff. We're excited about getting this RV done and being able to go on a trip in it, so hopefully we can get it done in time. He told me when he cut it apart, it's actually a double layer drive shaft, so I probably would have ran into trouble if I would have tried to do this myself because he said it's got the outside steel, a rubber layer, and then the inside layer of steel, so it probably would have not turned out well. Ma'am, silence your phone, please. Well, we just crossed the Georgia state line, so we're in Georgia now. I love these old downtowns. Now here we are, look at all the drive shafts. Hudlow Axle. The Hudlow guys done there. We picked them up. They actually already had my drive shaft done for my Fairmont big block car. So we went ahead and picked it up. They're actually narrowing a rear axle for me right now with that thing. Let's get this thing home, get her installed. Well, I'm a pushover and Ralphie wants to go by the Honda dealership, look at dirt bikes. So we're gonna dabble at the Honda place, I guess, for just a second. We ain't buying nothing, I'll tell you that. You know, I can't help but notice that now that we're at a dirt bike place, you have a mullet. It's just happened um, sporadically. Yeah. Don't be looking at those wall. Maybe one day, huh? Yeah. Maybe one day. He wants that one. I want the big wheel one. We love our dirt bike stuff. We just don't have any good ones right now. Except for yeah. our 50. Yeah. Well, we made it out without buying anything. We didn't even get interrogated by any salesmen, so that's yeah. nice. And I grew up going into dirt bike places like that. I always love going into dealerships. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 10 o'clock. How do y'all get hungry every time we go to town? It's weird. Oh, no. Never fails, does it? Every time. What do you think I am? Some kind of pushover? Yes. <laughs> Chick-fil-A it is. And thank you to Phil for sending us a gift card. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much for eating on Phil today. And yes, they're babies still. Ralphie says his childhood got ruined because COVID wouldn't let him play on the playground for three years. <laughs> Let's get home and get this done. Thanks, Phil, again. Appreciate it. That's my wife's love language, Chick-fil-A. Well, guys, we survived it. Mom driving. It's just a 15 or 20 over the whole way trip. I'm on edge the whole time. Oh. He probably's never had Chick-fil-A fries, huh? Is that good stuff, guys? There you go, Rocky. So here's our new shaft here. I don't know the exact amount they cut off of it. I should have asked the guy, but they cut a couple inches off of it. Put us a new fatty bead on there, rebalanced it. I had them put new U-joints in it, front and back. So I'm trying to do everything to keep this thing from breaking down. They didn't have one to stop, but I'm gonna get a spare U-joint too, just in case. What is your deal? That bird. 
That's all he does all day long. I thought you were actually, I thought you were actually, I thought you were actually mad. No, he just. He just won't shut up. He's moved in up there in the tree and will not shut up. I'm gonna go ahead and throw this drive shaft in real quick just to make sure we're good on our link. Oh yeah, that looks dead on to me. I might could have got it, but it's better sometimes to let the professionals do it instead of jarring your false teeth out all the way to Arizona and back. You're dead. Thank you, you all. You're She's nibbling on the rear axle. Now, if we get this thing running, we have gears and it won't roll off anymore. So that's one step closer. Yeah, awesome. If you're gonna do a van for an engine swap, you're probably better off to buy one that has a truck front end on it. it makes a lot easier than this one. We'll get there though. Quit. <laughs> Me alone. <laughs> So what we're doing here is pulling the wires out. These are all wires that went under the dash of the Durango and they are not gonna power anything that they used to power, but we are gonna use this to power new things. So I got them going over here. We're gonna tie them all back together to kind of untangle this. So we know which wires go to which relays. We're all three working on tracing this out. We're trying to find all the wires that are cut and bring them back this way. And they taught me to turn the air on. That's one nice thing about renovating the back of your RV before you get the engine running right is you can sit in the AC while you do it. We have everything going to its uh, respective positions and we got them all zip tied up. So this is like the transmission here. We have one that goes from the power distribution center over to the PCM over here. These are in three different bundles and I'll zip tie them together on the way down. This is our OBD2 plug, so which we're gonna have it on the dash. I will show you which pins you have to have to do that when we get it wired in. Also got our overdrive off switch wire is over here. But every time you unwrap a harness like this, you usually end up with a, one or two wires that are just the wrong length for whatever reason. So this sensor ground wire here that goes down to the transmission, this wire was all up here and this is all in a bundle. So if I add two feet to this, it's gonna make it much easier. Good thing about cutting down a harness like this is you end up with tons of extra wire. We've got a huge pile out there, I'll show you. So I'm gonna use one of the wires we cut out and connect in here and lengthen this one wire because all the rest of the wires are that long except for that one. And what we're gonna use on this wiring project is our solder stick connectors. So you've seen me use these in the past. So we've got the low temperature solder connectors that are waterproof. We've also got the ring connectors and the spade connectors. So if you go to solderstick.com and use code Josh20, you're going to get 20% off your order. So thank you to Solder Stick for helping us out with that. It'll make quick work of this wiring job here. Let me show you how it works. So you can see the adhesive here that makes it waterproof and the low temperature solder in the middle. And all it takes is a heat gun to be able to do this. So you just put your wires in there, meet them up in the middle like that, hit it wall wall. And you'll see when it gets melted, it'll flow out into the copper strands. See the copper strands turning silver? And there you go. You got a nice watertight connection, even used on marine applications and stuff like that. So now we have an extra couple feet for our main transmission plug. The only mess we got now is just right in here. We're about to try to tape it up and get out of the way. So this guy's gonna go down that direction right there towards the transmission. So this is our fuse box. We've got it straightened out. These are all the only wires we're using to run the engine. These right here. And these are extra wires for the most part. Now there is a couple in here that are important. Like I said, the main powers and grounds. A lot of these are gonna get cut out, but I wanna make sure of what I'm using and what I'm not. Cause a lot of these relays that aren't getting used anymore or fuses, we can wire new things to them. Why don't you get up there wall and I'll push it through to you. Okay. It's like pulling a calf. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Keep pulling and, and go to it toward the battery side, toward the driver side. Over that way. Okay. Here's the main computer plug. Power distribution center going that way. PCM, computer wires going that way. Now we're gonna do our overdrive off switch and our OBD2 plug, which our OBD2 plug, if you don't know what that is, that's the little plug under your dash that when they read your codes on your car to tell you what's wrong with it, it tells them what's going on with your car. So we will be able to, you know, it starts acting up on us. We can read the codes and see what's wrong. And we can also hook up a tuner to this if we want to and have a digital dash like our truck has, our tow truck has. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, advantages to having the OBD2 plug still available. Looks like we're going to have way more than enough, hello Wa, to uh, do what we need to do because this is just going to go right here. So we're probably going to cut five feet off that wire. That's a good thing to have extra wire and not enough. Ralphie, I noticed you're avoiding the wiring issue here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to do no wiring? No. 
eight. Let's see if we can figure out somewhere to mount this computer in our fuse box. This is the bunch of wires that I took out of the system. A lot of this is headlight stuff. Yeah, that's for the wiper motor, brake proportioning valve, ABS. So this is a lot of extra wires that we can use the wire, but we don't need it for what it originally did. <laughs> Never gets old, does it? No. Nope. We might can mount right there. That would probably be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah. We might have room for this. Surely. I believe this is a factory voltage regulator. We can get it out of the way. We also need to take the factory ignition box out because we're not using that anymore either. They're bad to mess up because of not having a good ground a lot of times. They are kind of known to go out. I think this little tab here is messing us up. We're going to cut that off. What do you think, Wall? Think it'll fit right there? Yeah, sure. It's probably good as place as any. The other one was under the hood anyway. So I'm trying to clean my connections. This is specifically made for electrical connections. Just to clean out that, because we want to have a really good connection with our PCM. I'm trying to make sure I have enough length here to mount it. I don't want to screw it in and then realize it won't fit there. Okay, well, that'll work right there. Right, <laughs> Two holes. Two's good enough? Yeah. Our factory battery cables are in terrible shape, so I plan on replacing them. So I'm gonna go ahead and unhook this stuff. This was a train wreck. There's really nothing to even go off of here because look at inside here. Somebody had done all this craziness with the wires and I've had this thing about burned down on me a couple times. We're not gonna worry about the way they had it hooked up. We're gonna figure out our own right way. I have no idea what this was, but these two wires went together and they came out from this hole. I'm gonna leave them there for now until we figure out what they did. Look, this guy is just holding on by a lock of my hair. It's a lock of my hair. For Mopars, everything in the system powers through this relay right here. It's kind of an odd setup. I've got to figure out what to do with that as well. You can see where the harness has melted at certain times. That's always good, you want that. Look at that. Whatever this blue wire was, the wire is gone. The shielding is still there. That must have been the one they replaced with this red wire. Okay. We're going to peel some of this old electrical tape off there. It's all oily under there. Look at how oily the wires are. I just want to make sure all of our wires are good. I don't want to hook to something that's junk and not know it. How do you keep getting out anyway, huh, Booger? They're so nosy. Super I never nice. knew they were so nosy. Especially the bottle fed ones like them. They're super duper nosy. See, this is what I was talking about right there. See how that wire is bare? Mm -hmm. That was hidden underneath the tape. So that's why I like to untape them to make sure. Now that we got that all unpeeled, I'm gonna go ahead and plug in our stuff for like our transmission. Cause I think we've got basically all the engine connected now. But we need to see to do like the starter and transmission and O2 sensor, stuff like that. Quit touching me with that. This goes right here, should plug right in. And this is our main transmission plug right here. So we got them plugged in. Only thing I'm a little bit worried about is that wiring harness and computer is for a four wheel drive and this is a two wheel drive, but everything I've read, guys are saying you can swap the computers back and forth without a problem. So hopefully they're right. Now we also have a output speed sensor right here. Yep, okay. Unfortunately, that transfer case had caught fire on that Durango and burned up some of the harness. This was a plug-in that went to the transfer case. So I'm just gonna unplug it and just leave this plug loose. This is bank one sensor one auction sensor. So it will plug in here and we will drill a hole in this and put a bung in there and screw in that O2 sensor there. Unfortunately, the bank one sensor two plug is completely melted off of here. So I got a new sensor and I've got a new wiring pigtail that's supposed to come in today. And we will rewire the end of this and I'll probably put it right behind the first one because this vehicle is not equipped with catalytic converters from the factory. Maybe we can figure out a way to trick it to where we won't have a check engine light on all the time. Yeah, I'm just going to cut that off. That wire is not even good at all. Okay, I think we got everything hooked up on our transmission now, as far as electrically. Rocky wants to help, by the way. Oh, yeah. Rocky's right in the middle of this. He's looking for tape. Please. He's scratching up against the van. So I really can't show you this because of where it's at, but there's two main grounds that originally bolt to the power steering pump. I'm bolting them right here to the cylinder head at the very front of the engine. And we're also hooked up the main charging wire from the alternator, which goes to the power distribution module. And I've got another main ground that's up here by the coil, which I plugged my coil in right there. But there's a ground by the coil that the ends broke off. I'm gonna put a new end on it. Did Squeezy slink out? 
a long time ago. I haven't seen her in like an hour. <laughs> you don't never know when she leaves. She don't ask no questions. She no. don't make no comments. Some people say they saw her. Some people never came back alive. Looks like that's a 14 gauge. Should be a blue one. This has built-in heat shrink in it. These ring connectors, they just crimp on. Then do the heat shrink and you're good to go. I'm gonna bolt this one to the front of the cylinder head as well right there. That may be all of our major grounds. So now I'm gonna give you all the secrets here. This is the OBD2 plug and the wires you need to hook up for it is you have two different sets of CAN wires, which CAN, CAN bus, which is basically you can use one wire to send multiple signals and I don't understand it at all. So you have a pink wire, a purple with a white stripe and a purple and a white with a black stripe. And they're super easy to identify because they're braided together. So you need those two sets of CAN bus wires. That only leaves you with these three wires here. The bottom right is your power wire. So this gets power all the time. So we'll run this straight to the fuse box. And then these two here are your grounds. The one on the left up top is your chassis ground and this is your signal ground. Now that I know how long these wires need to be, I can go ahead and cut them. There's quite a bit of length still on this. So basically should be able to cut them just right past there. Boop. So all this is just extra wire now. So that's all four of our CAN bus wires there. Now we just gotta hook up our grounds and our power wires. But I'm not gonna hook those up right now until we get some more figured out with our fuse box. But this will come across here. We'll tuck it up all nice and neat and it'll be just like a new vehicle is. We can check our codes. This is the bracket that holds the OBD2 plug. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off. really necessary kitty so i cut that bracket down went the extra mile painted it even can you believe that you're going all out for this i don't know i'm trying to do it right the first time this guy right here should there you go now i have an obd2 plug we'll tie all that up out of the way later and I did trace this wire while I was down there that was wrapped around all this and going here. It goes to the brake proportioning valve. Mystery solved, Ralphie. So I'm back under here at the starter now, and this is the starter wire, I believe, that actually starts the engine when you turn the key on. And it plugs in right here. I drilled a little hole right there so we can hook up this throttle spring here. So this, I believe, changes your line pressure as you give it more throttle. There's a cable that goes from here that goes up to the throttle body we gotta hook up as well. So it's got a bracket that bolts to the back of the transmission here. There's a special ear for it. And this guy here just pops right on that ball. The way we made this work was we used the old style 727 shift lever, which goes to our factory 727 shift linkage. We put the new style lever on top to go to you know i call this the kick down but i guess it's called the throttle pressure so we got our spring in there we should have all of our linkage hooked up we just got to run transmission lines and fill this thing up now get on the hunt oh yeah he's always on the hunt i'm gonna go ahead and drill the holes and install these o2 sensors we actually got these o2 sensor bungs in the fan mail so it worked out perfect So now we got two in here. Now this is pretty redundant because there's no catalytic converter in between, but I'm trying to give it all its signals. I don't know if it would screw it up if you left the second one off or not. It might not even matter. I also found a ground strap on the back of the cylinder head over here and bolts it to the frame on the inside. Uh, it's got quite a few grounds. I hate rolling around on the floor like that, but there's not enough room underneath that transmission crossover to get in and out of there. So the other end of this cable just snaps right into this factory thing there, hooks onto that, and now when the throttle goes open, it's pulling on the transmission. Let me show you. There you go. And that makes your transmission man happy. So this cable goes over, one goes to the starter and one goes to the power distribution block. So that powers everything and this gets a uh, direct line to the starter. We are gonna sign off for today though, because church night. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Maybe we can fire this thing off tomorrow. Word. Next day we're back. We're rested and refreshed. I gotta get into this wiring some more and why don't y'all go ahead and put the fluids in it? Y'all can put the antifreeze in it, power steering fluid, you can start doing that. While we can I'm put on this. fluids in it already? It was ready in the last video to put the antifreeze in it. Okay. So if y'all wanna start doing that while I'm doing this, that's something we can all be doing. Actual antifreeze or water? Mix. Actual. A mix. 
You don't want straight antifreeze. It costs you a whole paycheck. Come on, yeah, we ain't made money around here. Did you roll with a dog? Um, it sat in my chair. If you didn't watch the last video, we got a brand new four core aluminum radiator. That's a direct bolt in for this. And it's a frost spot and we're really excited about it because that's a very important part of an RV you're trying to go out in the middle of the summer with is a good radiator. So this is pin 31 and 32 on connector C1. So these guys right here are your main grounds for PCM. So I'm gonna go straight to the negative terminal of the battery with them. Actually, if you wanted to simplify it, you could cut them out right here because this is just the main harness coming out of the engine harness and it just plugs into here and these just come out the bottom of it. So I could cut them here. Since we're using this already, I'm gonna keep it in this and go over to the battery. I see a hose. It's leaking. You might look from the top. I'm seeing it dripping. It's above up. the open. We'll get in the van and look down and see if you can find it. I'm gonna crimp them together and we're just gonna bolt it right to that negative terminal there. That bird's already up and going. Oh yeah. Where. He's right there. I don't know where he moved from, but he lives here oh, now. I see him. We're gonna have to name him if he's just gonna hang out here all the time. Golly, he's loud. I don't know which one it's coming from, but there's a water temp sensor here. There's a heater hose and there's a thermostat housing. I can't tell which one right now. I want to see if I can tighten up the hose. That would be the easiest solution. I think it's the thermostat housing. I and mean, we did tighten it, right? Surely we tightened it? Surely we tightened it. This is an unfortunate event. Yes, it is. Well, here's your shot of it. The water's coming out around that bolt. So I'm just hoping that I didn't tighten that bolt all the way. I really don't want to take this back off, but it's really an unfortunate spot to work on. I think we may have left it loose. <laughs> I hope I hear the drip stop leaking. Who was on that project? Well, I'm not sure, but that wasn't super tight. Like, the drip's slowing down and I think that was it. That must've been Ralphie right there. Ralph, did you leave that loose? No, I never even with it. That's the problem, you should have tightened her up. Definitely yeah. Ralphie on that one. Souse her down now. I don't wanna break it. Get her right to the verge. You're just right before? Right when before. When you feel the bolt stretch stop? Yeah. I think that may have stopped it, at least slowed it down because I don't hear it dripping now. Hopefully crisis averted. Yes. You wanna hear my pterodactyl scream? Ah! Oh Lord. I don't wanna waste it here. We recycle that stuff, don't we? Yeah. Is that all? It's just a scotch more and I don't know how to... <laughs> so this is your main wire that turns on the PCMs. It needs to get power in the start and the run position. It's a green one with a black stripe. It comes through the same way. It goes from the engine harness into that plug and out the bottom of the plug right here. So once again, you could cut it off the top, but I'm gonna leave it on the bottom. I wonder what ground LOL LOL means. Wawa was helping me label this. I don't know what you're talking about. Woo! That beetle drain down. Okay, we're full. It'll probably need more once the thermostat opens. How many gallons was that? Um, this is like three, four, five, almost five. Five gallons? Wait. No, 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 no. Is that math One, face? Two, what is this? Four, four and. Oh, wait, mom was right. Almost five gallons. Four and three quarters. Put the lid on it. Good morning, Walkie. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Hi. Granny, looking lovely. Hi, Flower. Hi. Hi, sweet girl. So we've got a new drip. Unfortunately, it is coming from somewhere up high. I don't know if that's the water pump gasket or what, but there's some sort of new drip up that way that I'm probably going to avoid until we figure out what it is. I can't see exactly where it's coming from because it's front end so tight. But somewhere up around where the water pump is, or maybe just above it. That's terrifying. No, it'd be bad. We should have waited. Oh, this morning's so. not starting off good. It's kind of damper on our scamper. Ooh, I can see. Why is the sun green? Oh my god. <laughs> so cool. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> it's overflowing. They're putting power steering fluid in now. Oh, you ain't chilling. <laughs> okay. I can't see it. Oh. Hey, 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 hey. Imagine that. Mm. You just overfilled it, right? Yeah. 
since we gotta find a power wire that has power in the start and the run position, we're gonna start working on the Vans harness now. So these Mopars, they have a black wire coming from the alternator in through here to the amp gauge. And before it gets to the amp gauge, it splits out to the ignition switch and your lights and your fuse box and everything like this image here shows. All the charging system went through that amp gauge, back out through the fusible link here, which this is what burns out if you get an overload from your alternator or whatever, or something gets grounded out inside the alternator or anywhere in the harness. This is what keeps your van from burning down or your car. So it comes out from the fusible link to the starter relay, which is kind of where everything out here gets power and then it goes back to the battery. So we are going to completely take out the amp gauge. We're gonna run a bolt gauge instead of an amp gauge because it's really not a good design. Aside from this one pin here, the rest of this looks pretty good. As you can see here, this is what I was talking about. We have a burnout fuse block here, unfortunately. So probably what I'm gonna do is cut this out completely and put a new aftermarket one in so we don't have to deal with this. This is that blue wire and this is the red wire that was coming through the firewall. I think somebody's added that to power some of this stuff so i don't know exactly what fuse that is i wish i had an owner's manual here to tell me because the numbers are melted off i may have to look it up and see what circuit that is instruments cigar it says i thought that was a cigarette lighter it's a cigar lighter this is fancy <laughs> dome light so we got to figure out which circuit that is and what they've done to bypass it we googled a picture of a good one that's not burn up and this is your horn and backup lamps 20 amp this is your accessory so that's you know everything that turns on with the key basically that's 20 amps the one that burn up was the heat and ac so maybe that's why they put a aftermarket under dash unit in this thing because mm. it burnt that up so they're all 20 amp except for that one i'm gonna get my aftermarket fuse panel that we're gonna use so we're cleaning the electrical connections inside this bulkhead connector i expected to see a big burn up one that's why i took it apart but it's really not trying to get any sort of corrosion and stuff off here and inspect all these because we don't want a big nasty corroded connection or it's going to be good for nothing i've seen where a lot of guys take these out and drill holes through them and and run it straight through but it has these little wires that lock this in at the top you got to take those wires out before you can pull these out but all of our connections actually look pretty good from what i can tell i gotta get to the back of this dash to look at our wiring especially to our amp gauge here because we're going to unhook all that i know the amp gauge was still working but it's a problem on these mopars about burning out and i want to make sure we don't have any other melted wires with this word since we're already all up in it we are all up in it they've added something here and taped it it's like a breaker in here and taped it up maybe that had shorted out on or something i unhooked our broken speed owner cable since our transmission doesn't have a mechanical speed owner that ain't gonna matter anybody see anything melted what about under the tape yeah, we probably have to unwrap it. Look, here's a dirt dauber's nest in there. Down in there is our flashers for our blinker. We almost ran our screws into, mm. looks like. Oh, wow. Good thing we didn't do that. So that red wire that they had poked through the grommet is twisted and taped as a green wire. Okay, so that's powering this, which is their blower motor. So that's what the red wire poked through the firewall was. They were trying to power their blower motor on their aftermarket AC system. Mystery solved on the red wire. So I'm just gonna unhook this. We'll rehook it up to our new fuse block. So I know I can look. Don't ever do that, guys. Come on. What in the Jeff Brown is that? You don't, you can't just <laughs> twist them together. Look, there's like two locks left of that hair. It's a lock of my hair. And that's all that was holding it. Come oh on, guys. Gosh. Do that's, better than that. Don't twist and tape it. That's absolutely impeccable right there. I know. There's the end of our broken speed owner cable. Uh, wow. I do wish that we could hook it up. I think if you have a 46RH, a hydraulically controlled overdrive, it still has the mechanical speed owner output and you could use it, but we have the RE. So we've actually ordered one of the uh, Edge CTS2 digital dashes. Hopefully we'll be able to display our speedometer speed up here on digital dash. It's also programmable, so you can tell it your casing height, you can tell it your gear ratio, so your speed owner is accurate. So my wife knows exactly how fast she's going. Hey, I'm gonna unplug that joker when I'm driving. You don't need to know that facts. <laughs> Here is the back of our amp gauge, which I'm honestly surprised these wires aren't melted. So we're just gonna disconnect this completely, even though it does still work. Our digital dash should have a voltage display, so we will, shouldn't have to have these mechanical gauges anymore. I'm trying to figure out which wires feed this fuse box. So that guy does. Those two there feed off that oh. black one. 
The way this works is these two circuits here, which are cigarette lighter, your dome light, and your exterior lamps, they get power all the time, the black wire from your alternator. Then your instrument cluster lights, they have a power source that comes off of the headlight switch, this brown wire with a white stripe. And the orange one goes out to turn on your instrument lights, which goes in this main junction here to all the instrument lights and dash lights. There's also a heavy black wire that comes off of this main black wire coming from the alternator that goes over to your ignition switch. And when you turn the key on, power comes out through the blue wire and that powers your accessories, your heat and air, your back up lamps all that stuff so we are going to set this up with two different aftermarket fuse blocks to power all this stuff and just cut this out completely all right ralph you make me a label for this one this is our power in and our power out to our instrument cluster right, they're laying eggs come on water rip it's just it's just masking tape right? i know but it wouldn't rip this one is our exterior lamps Cigar and yes, cigar. Where do you go? Did it answer back? No, <laughs> but I, I always talk to my wiring harnesses. Mm. You got to talk to them or they don't know what you're trying to do. Makes sense, don't it, Ralph? Indeed. This is another reason why you have to unwrap your harness. Look at that one right there. They've twisted that bad boy together. I don't know why they did. And I'm not sure what circuit it is yet, but we'll figure it out. They were related tomorrow. 100%. 100 so there you go. Now we don't have to deal with this anymore. That gets rid of a lot of potential fire hazards as well. Can I throw it? So if you watch our second channel, I bought these at the Rod Run up in Pigeon Forge. I really like these. This is a smaller version. It just has the power side, no ground. They make some that are like 30 bucks that have the ground strip on them. I think everything we're working with here pretty much is just positive wires. So we're gonna do one for accessory power and one for constant power. They also have this cover that pops off. It comes with labels to mark what you're doing. They also light up with little LEDs if the fuse is blown. I just really like them. There may be a different brand that's better, but I really like these. So we're gonna do our constant power one first and the way we did that is we unwrapped the harness and ran the heavy black and heavy red wires which came from the fusible link and the starter relay in and from the alternator in from the factory and we're going to route them straight to here but instead of going through the starter relay and through the alternator we're going straight to the battery source with these it's actually really convenient because the studs on the back of the amp gauge are exactly the same size as this stud so it just screws right on there Woo! Woo. Since this instrument cluster lights, it only gets power from one wire and only has power from going out. There's no reason to make a whole fuse block just for that. So what we're gonna do here is I've got an inline fuse, a five amp one, and we're going to directly connect these two with an inline fuse that's reachable from under the dash. What does that say? Um, tube. Lamps tube, which is stupid. We call each other tubes. And, and that is- Cigar and don't light and so call me maybe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for labeling those for me. Is that your favorite one? Uh, yeah. Milo. Oh, he did it. That's a big one. Yeah. This is our accessory power wire. It's going to power the whole accessory fuse box. And I'm going to have to lengthen it because it was only about this long right here. We won't reach. And we're using a 10 gauge wire to make sure it's plenty big enough to power everything we need to power in here. So now we can power all of our stuff that switch power off this right here. I just gotta find out if this has power when the key's on or if it has it in crank as well, because we gotta have crank as well on that one wire. Can work. I'm going ahead and wiring in my constant power source for my OBD2 plug. Now that we have a source for that. I've still gotta hook up my ground though, but we'll get there. Oh, oh, he's attacking me. He ran like full speed all the way over here. Now I'm gonna hook up my chassis ground from my OBD2 port. I got this ground lug I'm gonna screw down and then I'll run a heavy gauge wire out to the negative terminal on the battery and that way we'll have a good ground source in here. You like the plastic bag? Foam sniff, eh? Yeah. I went ahead and got down here and we got our plug last night after church for the bank one sensor two and wired it in. We kind of had to guess the wires because they had nothing to go off of, right Jamal? Three of the wires were the same as the other sensor. So I just matched them up and hope that the fourth one was correct. We'll just zip tie this stuff up out of the way. We're gambling monopoly money with the dice. Yeah, but we have jobs. So it's more for sure. I think we're gonna hook the battery up. What? 
Are we ready for this moment? We gotta get our power wire sorted out to our computer and we need a source that's hot when you have the key on and start. So I guess we're gonna go ahead and hook this up and see what mm. happens. So this is gonna send power to the Durango fuse box, which has seven blue million wires down here not hooked up. And it's also gonna send power to our new ones under there. So none of these do anything, right? None of the ones hanging on the ground will do anything right now, but we're probably gonna use some of them. Back up, Ralphie. Ooh. The dome light came on. <gasps> ah! Go check it out, Ralphie. You did something right. Hey, it works. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I don't see no fires or nothing, do you? I don't see no fire in No, I don't. I don't, I don't see no fire in about to bust your butt. We should have power to our OBD2 port, which we do. This is power to our rear lamps, our headlights. So all this has constant power like it's supposed to. See if the headlights come on. Yes, yeah, I them. We'll have to switch them out to our holly. Break them back. First click, so that's 12 volts. So if I go Ooh. to start, it kills power to that. So we can't use that power source to power up the ECU. We should have a good ground here. Yes, we do. Where are we gonna find something that has power when it's key on? Well, let me check some of the other circuits on this and see if there's another one that has it. Go to the crank position. Okay, let off. I figured the best place to do this would be the same place where the old engine got its power. So we went to the ballast resistor wires and there's two wires feeding this. So you have a key on only wire, which went through the ballast resistor and got knocked down to lower voltage. And then there's a wire coming out that is only in cranking. So this was in cranking to give it full 12 volts to the coil. So my idea is to take both of these, trace them back into there, tie them together, see if that'll work in order to power the computer. Try it, Ralph. Switch getting hot or anything? No. I have a question. Yeah. What were you looking for? Like sparks to fly? Yeah, I or sparks flew. I did the wrong thing. So. Smoke. There may be an argument for putting an inline diode or something, but we'll try it this way first. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? Exactly. We're back to our green with a black stripe wire. It's what it turns on the ECU. It's actually a really small wire. It's not 18 gauge. So we're going to splice it into these like this right here and it should have power on crank and run i hope that works i know on Ford, it's like impossible to find a wire that has power for both crank and run that's a really typical problem people run into when doing an efi swap key on okay all right turn to crank that's right it's at least working on the voltmeter so right there our computer should have powered up and turned on i have no way of knowing but let's get our starter wire figured out i believe that this yellow wire coming off the bottom of the relay, if it gets grounded, that's what starts the car, I think, maybe. If I touch this, I think the engine might turn over. Oh my gosh, are you doing it right now? That won't start, it'll just turn over. Is the key on? Must be wrong. All right, let's try sending power to it. No. So I'm looking at the wiring diagram here and I think I may have forgot about the neutral safety switch because it's plugged in the transmission, so I'm gonna put it up in park. Mmm, good call. So the yellow wire gets a power signal, and that clicks the starter relay, which goes this brown wire, which goes down the starter. Okay, I think I got it figured out now. We just didn't have it in park. So we should be able to take the yellow wire from the starter relay. Now this is a micro, I think they call it an ISO, but it's a micro relay. The way this works is, let me pull one out here and show you. If you're looking at the pins like this, this is your power supply in, and this is your power supply out. This is the normally closed circuit, and this is normally open, which means if you have power to here, this one's on all the time. And if you go to turn whatever it is on, it sends power to here. So most of the time, you're just going to use these four pins and not this one most of the time. So the way our starter relay works is power into here, power out to the starter from here. And then it gets a positive signal on this side, which is what's turning our relay on. And then it has a ground signal on this side. If we send a power signal to this from this orange wire, which is the factory starter wire, it should click our starter relay and turn our starter over. So we're going to hook the orange wire to the yellow wire. This is just a signal wire to the relay. So this does not have any kind of high amp load on it whatsoever. Check us out on other platforms at Sleeper Dude 88. Let's see if this works. Now we don't have anything hooked up as far as fuel system, so it won't start. <gasps> oh my gosh. <laughs> Good job. That works. Hey, 
If I haven't said, always buy an RV that comes with a motel key tag. Hey, we're not taking that off either. No, never. It's never coming off. So we got a starter that works. That's, You're doing good. That's a good start. Okay. And we know we have power to the ECU because the ECU tells that starter relay when to go. It takes a signal and goes down through the park neutral safety switch. So this thing will not start unless it's in park. And then it goes back around to that starter relay and tells it so. You're the smartest person I know. That means the computer is doing its job because the computer is involved in making this start. Awesome. It's it weird, right? It's crazy. It the it's mind boggling. That's okay. an achievement. I will say that starter sounds way better than the old one did. Yes, it does. That old one would go to about half a turn and get to that broken tooth and make a terrible noise. Terrible. Oh, we're getting there now. We're getting there. I turned your frown upside down, didn't it? I mean, we've been out here all day and all day yesterday doing wiring. I mean, it's a lot. very tedious. You're not seeing a lot of what's going on because there's a lot of reading and looking and looking at diagrams. A lot in between this is going on. This should be the power wire out to the fuel pump. Ralphie, turn the key to the on position. Okay. It's still on? Yeah. Computer's working. That's it, awesome. It sent a priming signal to the pump. So we've got to hook up this in because it went from the factory up under the dash. So it is a signal wire. It was to a 10 amp fuse under the dash of the Durango. So it's green with a black stripe coming out of the fuel pump relay. This will go to a power source that gets power when the key's on and when cranking as well. And this one goes out to our fuel pump. So that means if we hook up this green with a black stripe wire of the fuel pump relay to a power source, then our fuel pump wire will work. And speaking of fuel pumps, we've got to get that hooked up as well, or this is never going to run. So since this fuel pump relay has to have power start and run, I'm going to wire it in with the, the start and run wires for the computer itself. And this actually splits out to the auto start relay as well, which is what shuts your car off when you shut off. But they're all the same color, so they are all do the same purpose. So I'm gonna put them together. All these do is they are just hot wires that send a signal to the relay. So they have very, very light amp load. So we have all the necessary power wires for our fuel pump. The only other things I have labeled in this harness to hook up is there is a ground here, but I found out this is for the blower motor relay, which when we do our under dash AC, we may hook that up and our fuel pump wire. So I guess we're gonna get started on plumbing the transmission and fuel system or we're never gonna be able to start this thing. So me and Ralphie are gonna clean up this mess and clean the floor up, attempt to put down some sound deadener mat stuff, right? <laughs> How do you think that's gonna go? <laughs> What we're going to use for our transmission and our fuel line is this Earl Super Stock hose. It's good up to 250 PSI, so it's much better than just buying old rubber fuel line from the parts store. But all it does is push in there like that. I'll put a hose clamp on it probably on the transmission line because it's such high pressure, but it's designed to just be able to be pushed right in there and then you're good to go. So let's get this installed. We're using some tough stuff to clean this off because it's tough. So we're gonna clean this before we put our mat down. It was nice and white and clean and it's gotten dirty. But once we this shit looks up. Oh. I hear the link one. What are you doing? You come to help wire? That's our factory fuse. Oh bus. my gosh. That, that. <laughs> so it had completely melted that right there. So ah, I cut, put some aluminum foil. Uh, yeah, or a 22 bullet. Yeah. So I just cut everything out of it, put all new fuse boxes in. So. Yeah, it'd be fine. So I snuck back under here to the transmission to see. I thought I could use a straight line, but you can see it runs right in the shifter. So I'm going to do a 90 degree fitting right here. And our back trans cooler line it can be straight. We'll just tie it up out of the way so it doesn't touch the exhaust or anything. So now I know which fittings we need for up here. Now we just kind of got to figure out where we're going to mount our trans cooler i had thought about mounting it under here honestly i don't know maybe i could mount it up in that corner over there there's a lot of space under here more than we have in the front of the van we have a couple inches before it hits the drive shaft we have ample room underneath this van and it has its own fan so if you're sitting in traffic you can see sitting here running i really think i may make me a really nice bracket and just mount this guy right here it's away from the exhaust or any heat sources really we even got these mr gasket aluminum them wrenches so we wouldn't scratch all our AN stuff. So we're about to do all the plumbing on the big block Fairmont as well. Are you just dying to do it? Is that what yeah. you're trying to do? Here. <laughs> They're cool. They keep you from scratching up your fittings. <laughs> you're good to go, bud. Are you gonna come help today or are you just gonna eat? He's just gonna eat today. Rocky. We all work on his schedule. Oh yeah. 
This is gonna be the first time I've ever put sound deadener back in the car. I've always taken it out of a car, but kind of with a motorhome, when you're going across the country and you gotta be filming, especially, we want it to be quiet, so that's why we're putting the sound deadener down. Uh, Have you seen how quiet it is in here? Like if it's raining outside and you hear it in here, it's like 10 times quieter. That's good. We did a good job then. Is it good? That looks excellent. You ready? Stick her down. Oh, jeez. Oh, you better sticky. Yeah, it's sticky. There ain't no moving around. Oh, lords. How are we gonna do this? I might be able to do this. You got this. I don't got this either. <laughs> Woo, there you go. We need Wawa out here helping. You haven't put over any seat holes, have you? Oh, yeah? You we did. I pick them out right there. There's one. Cut those holes out because we got to have the seat Oh, holes. yeah. We could just sit this down and, yeah. Where is that? We ain't going over no holes this time, are we? No, we're good. Here, help me, help me. Stick it in. you go it's pretty fun isn't it yeah. better than wiring yeah i'll make a great team <laughs> thank you he tells you how to do it oh yeah 100 <laughs> percent of the time yeah, i'm fine with the wire you go ahead and push it down so i need to make a bracket like this ralph it goes to the floor and back to this cross member. And see, that way it won't be any lower than anything else on the car. 28 inches, probably oh. ought to be enough. And then I'll just have to bend it to shape. I need two pieces to 28 inches. Here's a piece off an of old shelf I got from work. We'll use it. All he does is look for stuff to eat. Rocky, have you been eating the Hanes manual? Oh my gosh. Rocky, no. We're never gonna get this thing wired with you doing that. You're into it today, aren't you? Leave the stuff alone. You got all this green grass and you wanna eat cardboard and wrapping paper. It's corn. Face for the camera? No. Please? <laughs> She's gonna try to lure Rocky back in there. Watch what he does when he hears the animal cracker bag. <laughs> <laughs> he has the funniest run, huh? His back legs are like completely stiff the whole time. Yeah. He took the bait. And now that we got that one made, I'm just making a twin to it. Now this may not be an identical twin. I'll try my best. It may be more paternal, you know, than identical. You think it's close enough, Ralph? Yeah. 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 Certainly. Can I say it again? Certainly. <laughs> it smells good. Man, that's a ripper, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just noticed it's got a Spal electric fan, which is a really good brand. So that's a puller fan, which is the most efficient way to do it. Let's go ahead and mount it up now. We got our brackets done. <laughs> So there we go, I gotta bolt it down, but that's the gist of it. It's about the same height as the bottom of the rockers, which there's plenty of other things like the transmission cross member that's lower than that. We should be able to put nine degree fittings on this and go over towards the transmission, and I can wire this fan in through this temperature switch, and all will be good in the world. It's solid now. Let's start assembling our transmission lines. These are the Earl's AN super stock lines. All you gotta do, I bought these vice jaws here, which they're actually are magnetic and they're plastic so it doesn't mess up your fittings. I'm gonna vise these down in here like that. 
I'm gonna put a little lubricant on here to help it go on easier. And I'm just gonna push this on here all at once and try to bottom it all the way out. Like that right there. And then I'm gonna put a hose clamp on it just for extra insurance. You're organizing the hose clamp. I know. I'm gonna make it a little long just in case we ever had to do anything with it. And we'll clamp this thing up to the floor when we get done. That right there looks like a finger getter. Oh yeah. If I have ever seen one. Oh, that's a nice cutter. Never used this thing before. This end's just a straight fitting here. You see a lot of guys take the factory metal line. It's a 5 16 It's just slick with no barb. Cut it off, put a rubber hose on it and a clamp. And that's what my dad did on his Impala when I was a kid. And that car almost burnt to the ground over that. It blew the line off and burnt. So ever since then, every car I've ever built, I've done the transmission lines the correct way. <laughs> <laughs> Since when did you put these two things in? Where have you been, bro? You're gonna have to quit playing tiddlywinks and get in on this. He's been gambling. Yeah, quit that gambling, son. I like putting these together a whole lot better than those braided stainless ones. Golly, they're a pain. We got both the lines made now. We get this tightened up, it'll be the last thing on the transmission lines. I'm probably not gonna wire in that fan right this second. I'd rather get something done and get this thing to fire off. I think you would too. We can do that later. Went ahead and zip tied all these together, tied them up to the cross member. So we should be off our exhaust and away from our drive shaft and anything evil. I think we're all done down here. I think I'm gonna go ahead and put transmission fluid in and find that leak. So these things are supposed to take about 10 or 12 quarts, I believe. And this is a Dextron Mercon mix. I'm gonna, probably just gonna put all of this in. I've got three gallons here. Hopefully my dipstick doesn't leak. That's the only part I put in the transmission. Oh, great. I hate the smell of transmission fluid. Wow. Uh, smells yeah. like my childhood. Mm. I'm also putting a bottle of this LubeGuard friction modifier here. He recommended putting a bottle or two of that in it. So I actually already had some here from a different project. The Super Coupe. That's what it was. Remember we put this in the Super Coupe. Highly friction modified ATF supplement. Yeah, I don't remember that. You remember I that? Remember the bottle. Yeah, I remember your mama breaking a clutch in it. I remember that part. <laughs> I was just testing that bad boy out for you. <laughs> you should thank me. These big transmissions hold a lot of fluid, which I guess that's good. It probably keeps them cooler. I hope our trans cooler mount in the back works good because I, I really wish I could have mounted it up front. That would have been better, but there just wasn't room with the condenser. What? Sometimes you gotta make choices. Have an overheating transmission or have air conditioning and cool mm. yourself off. Do you want to be hot or your transmission? Word. We made the right choice. I've decided to put 10 quarts in it. We'll start there. I don't want to overfill it. Now, with the modifications he did to the lubrication system, we can check the fluid in park on this one. So before I get all those comments about you had to check it in neutral, I don't have to check this one neutral, but you do on a stock one. Well, I guess now it's on to the dreaded fuel system. And I kind of put it off because I know mom especially gets headaches from mm -hmm. having a bunch of gas smell. I have got to take the sending unit out of the tank so that we can do a return on it because it's going to have to have a return style system. System. I'm gonna have to drain it to do that, so we wanted to wait till the end of the day to do this. You're gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna have to pause. Okay, that's a good one. We're gonna go ahead and mount the regulator. This needs to be as close to the fuel rail as you can get it. You're not supposed to really mount it like at the back of the car or anything. So we're gonna get it somewhere up here away from the heat and it's fuel in, fuel out and return back to the tank. So we're gonna have to drill a hole in our tank and do a return line. And the return needs to be below the fuel level so you're not sitting there aerating the fuel. That's a big word, huh? Word. This is a bypass style regulator. It has a fuel pressure gauge built into it and you can adjust the fuel pressure from here. I believe it's also a boost reference right here, but. We ain't gonna boost yet. I think I'm gonna mount it right here. It says that either one of these can be used as the inlet or the outlet, but this one is your designated return line. Is that gonna fit under the doghouse? Probably. Oh yeah, we're good. Not a care in the world. So I showed this in the last video, but you may not have seen that one. I got this nifty little fitting from Earl's. It's a 5 16 fitting that clips onto the factory fuel rail and actually bolts it in there so it can't come off of there. That comes in real handy when you're trying to adapt from one type of fitting to another. It's just going to be a short little booger there. What's that gambling on back there? Monopoly <laughs> What back to the back of the van? All right, keep going. All right, there you go. I got this away from the cat. The cat had it? Penelope had it. Poor the, little guy. Poor guy. 
<laughs> so this is our setup here. We're planning on running for our fuel system. So this is a Holley 190 liter per hour fuel pump, which should be plenty for the engine we got in this thing. It's an external EFI pump. And also we have a Earl's 10 micron filter that goes after the pump. So this is gonna stop anything that might clog up our injectors. And we have the factory sock on the brand new sinew in the tank to catch any trash before the pump. So you wanna mount these below the fuel level and they need to be gravity fed down to them. With an electric pump, you always want it mounted as close to the fuel source as possible. And it needs to be gravity fed. If you are trying to pull fuel out of there, you see guys sometimes put these things up in the engine bay, like that's the worst thing you could do. It might work for a little while, but it ain't gonna work for long. And I got this fitting here, so we wouldn't even have to make a hose in between them. So we got that supply line run all the way back here, and it's gonna go into here. I think I'll make a special bracket that brings this down off the frame rail. I don't wanna put it up here, because then once the fuel level gets low, it's gonna be pulling into it. And then we'll bring a line straight from there into here. First thing we gotta do though, is unhook this fuel line and drain the tank, because we've also got to put a return into this. I have no idea how much gas is in it. We'll see how much comes out. Let's see if it covers me. That'll be great if it gets me in the face. That would be the best option. We put this new tank on this like probably a year and a half ago. Hmm. Not as exciting as I thought. What? Ain't no way. What? There's gotta be gas in there. Is that empty? Ain't no. Is it, is it empty? That's incredible. Why would it be empty? That don't make sense. I got a little tool here that Boat Deluxe on YouTube hooked me up with, and I'm going to try it. I guess they use it on boats to prime the fuel system. I'm gonna see if there's any fuel in there and it's just stuck. That thing's empty. How did it drive in here? It was dead empty? What? That's crazy, well. That's... It was just driving on fumes. What in the world? Convenient for me though, huh? Yeah. yeah. At least I don't have to drain it. It was dead empty. Whoa. That doesn't even make sense. That's incredible. Well, here, you can see our brand new sending unit here. There's a little sock on it. Look, it, it was in gas, so I guess it just had enough just to get around. It's funny, I've been putting this off all day and there wasn't even any gas to worry with. That's incredible. <laughs> it's got about a half inch of fuel, so it's right below the ring there. I'm gonna let this thing sit here tonight because it's like nine o'clock at night, which is way past our bedtime, right guys? Word. I bet it's sleepy, die. We got movies to watch. Yeah. We are gonna sign off for tonight and we'll come back tomorrow and finish this fuel system up. What's stopping us from starting it then? Nothing. Woo. Plug wires maybe. Yeah. Maybe, possibly. <laughs> All right, well, we will see you guys in the morning. Hit them with it, Ralph. No, um, I thought you were gonna chew off it. <laughs> Next day, we're rested and refreshed. Can you believe mom made apple fritters this morning? Woo, woo, woo. From the apple barn. You know, you watched the video, we went with the cab over truck. Yeah, she finally cooked the last of them, so. There's no telling what we can get done today on apple fritters, you know? Yeah, for real. I think we're gonna step it up big time. I woke up earlier than everybody else and went ahead and wired in the transmission cooler thing. I couldn't help myself, I guess. Let me show you how I did that real quick. So I traced some of these down. And I end up this third fuse forward here. It used to be for the rear defrost. So I changed it up to the transmission fan. It just comes out of that fuse, a big heavy gauge wire to the back. It's a 12 gauge wire coming back here. It goes into the temperature controlled switch, comes out of the temperature controlled switch to the positive side of the spout fan. And then the other side is grounded. I went ahead and welded a quarter inch bolt to the frame to give it a really good ground. So hopefully this is gonna work good for us right here. Now for the scary part. I've got this bulkhead fitting I had laying around here. So this connects a dash six AN to a 5 16 barb. So my plan is to drill a hole. I'm probably gonna put it up here and then we're gonna put a submersible 5 16 hose in it and turn it down into the fuel because you don't wanna just spray this fuel out and never, never land or you're gonna have problems with a bunch of air getting in there. That's not good for your fuel system. We just thought we might not try to see if our hand can fit. And I thought Ralphie's hand can fit. So Ralphie's hand's even too big. So I think we're gonna drill it right here because even I can get my fingers in there and return it right to there, so I guess that's what we're gonna do. I don't like drilling into a brand new gas tank like this. There you go, it's done now. Done, done it. Yeah. 
So I ran that magnet around there and you can see we got the shavings that fell down in there. It seems to be clean now. We should be good to put this on there. Hopefully this little washer keeps this thing from leaking. A little bit scary. Wawa is trying to finish up her insulation. She does good with the measuring and cutting. Kind of though. We got our 5 16 submersible fuel hose. You know that because it says it right on it. This stuff is not cheap at all. It is way more expensive than normal fuel line. $10 a foot or something. It's crazy. The other kind of fuel line is made to have fuel on the inside, but not on the outside. It'll swell up and become a real mess. Now I'm just going to figure out how to get this on there and get this on there somehow. <laughs> I got the nut started. At least we got that far. Oddly enough, this is an 18 millimeter on both sides, this fitting. So I somehow got an 18 millimeter wrench in there and I'm trying to hold it without dropping it. I would love to have done the poly drop-in fuel basket deal like we did on the Fairmont, but the top of this tank sits right against our RV floor. So I didn't think there was any way to do that. That's really the best way to do it though. This should droop down and be right in the bottom of the tank when we get it done. Can you believe that's like 10 bucks, that little support piece? Oh, wow. How can I get on there? Oh, man. It's floppy. It's under the carpet. No one will know. Well, I don't know how it's possible, but I got it on there. And I got a hose clamp on it. And I'm tightening it up, believe it or not. So as long as this doesn't leak, it should be good to go. That's incredible. Thank you, Ralphie. I'm gonna try to give you a shot of this so you can see it goes down the bottom of the tank. And maybe you can see, oh, uh, right there. You can see the clamp that's holding it on. So just don't leak, okay? Just don't leak. Let's put this back together. We got our gasket back in there, float. So it's got a notch here, making sure you have it oriented the right way. You know, I don't know if you've had this trouble, but these aftermarket tanks, these lock rings are just not what they used to be. It is not nearly as stout as a stock lock ring is, in my opinion. We kind of measured out where the fuel line needs to be. So I can cut this feed line now. And we'll put a straight end on this. And we can screw it into the pump. Okay. You'd be fine. Yeah, what's good? <laughs> Woo! I just put it over the sending unit here and clamped it. There's no pressure on this, only gravity fed fuel. There's our return in there. We just got to send this back up to the regulator. Keep going. Okay. Well, I think we are plumbed. That doesn't mean we're leak free, but we're plumbed. I'm going to go ahead and fill it up with fuel here. I still haven't even put the filler neck surround back on it. I got to get to that stuff. Is he going to leak, Ralph? Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. I can't believe it drove in here with no gas in the tank. Running on fumes. Mom does it every day, so. Hey, we're good. Woo. I'm gonna go ahead and wire in the fuel pump. We're using 12 gauge wire just to make sure we don't overload anything. Pull it up there. Stop, congrats. We're using our factory fuel pump wire from our Dodge Durango Power Distribution Center. It actually has a 20 amp fuse, which is what this fuel pump suggests you to run. So we're good to go there. Keep pulling right, right there, thank you. Okay, that should be about the right length there. And then we'll run a ground wire and we'll have this wired. You're rocking and rolling this morning. I'm going, yeah. I wanna hook up the ground for the fuel pump. Wait, is that loosen? No, just slip. Have you got it off yet? Yeah, I'm putting it on. Okay. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Should I put a washer on it? It's a, it, it might come off the nut, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't think it will, but. Whatever you think, Mom. In the washer on there. Okay, I got it. Good job, mullet man. This has the smallest little nuts that hold this down. It's like a five and a half millimeter. It's super duper small. So we got all of our plug wires on there now, except for the number one cylinder. And now I've got to drop this distributor in at the right spot. Now, there's actually a mark on the cam sensor here that shows you it needs to be pointing at the number one cylinder. I'm going to turn the engine over until we get to top dead center compression, and we will set this thing in the right spot. It actually should prime the fuel pump when I turn this key on. I heard something. I heard it. Not getting any pressure, though. Yeah, it's working. Oh, I'm starting to get pressure. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
it's working just fine back there. Here we go. Look, we're getting pressure. Look back there and see if there's any leaks, Ralphie. Okay. So it needs to be 50 PSI. It looks like it's a little higher than that. We got about 58. We can turn it down. Okay. All right. I don't see any leaks. I don't see any leaks up here. You can okay. hear it, like, just fine. Bump it a little bit, Ralph. All right, I felt compression there, so we must be pretty close. All right, turn the ignition switch off. You haven't heard it crank over, have you? No. You were gone with your friends yesterday. Oh, hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn this engine over by hand and try to find top dead center. All right, tell me if this is going down or up, engine. Ralph. We want it to come up and top out. It's coming up. Okay. It's coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up. Keep it coming. Go a little bit more. I think it's there. It was. It's here. It's here. Did it start to go down? Uh, yeah, I think it did. I'll back it up just barely. Tell me when it's at the top. There. So our gear is really close, but it looks like it's just a little bit too far. It needs to be pointing right here, according to everything I can find. So I want to try to move it one tooth over. There we go. So we are pointing straight this way with a little flat blade. So we should be in the right spot there. Now we can drop our distributor in. So we want the wires facing towards the back. And this is supposed to be pointing at the number one spot on this cam sensor. That right there. We have the bolts at the three and nine o'clock position for our distributor cap. This is pointing towards the number one cylinder on the cam sensor. That's supposed to be in time if we have it on top dead center number one correctly on compression stroke. Guys, are we there? We yeah, are we're there. there. We're there. Man, this has been a long... <laughs> <laughs> what, how many days has it been I done doing wiring? Like five. It was two days before we started the video. One, yeah. two. This is day five of wiring. And I still don't have everything wired. I've still got to wire in my tail lights. We don't need no tail lights. The air conditioning. We need air conditioning. <laughs> One, eight, four, three, six, five, seven, two. I think. It gets all the plug wires. So we're gonna top this off with some water here because we know it's been leaking a little bit overnight. Hopefully our water leak is something minor. But once we start this thing, we really need to let it run for a while and break in since it's got new rings and stuff in it, new bearings. We're hoping that the leak just magically seals itself. That would be best case scenario. All right, guys, this is it. Ooh. Did I do it right or not? Maybe, possibly. Am ah. I going to spend the next few days troubleshooting? Let's see. 64%. All right, we got the cam and crank sensor hooked back up. We do not have our oil pressure sending unit hooked up, but we do have an oil pressure gauge right here. Please work. attempt it ran i wonder if my timing's a little off Maybe. it sounds like it it's sounds. not the timing's not right does it yeah she loud uh, well it has no muffler hooked up well yeah but she loud right, let me uh loosen this distributor a little bit <laughs> we'll give it a little bit of a turn here and see if it likes that or not wow that's exciting. <laughs> it's super exciting. exciting something's a little off on our ignition tommy i don't know what it is all right let's get our fuel pressure i'm gonna back the fuel pressure off just a little bit maybe it's flooding it I think it's supposed to be about 48. That's right at like 48 there. We'll lock that down. Is it leaking anything? Look underneath it, aside uh, from maybe antifreeze. I see zero gas leaks. I don't see any leaks in the back. All right, go for it, Walt. Ooh. Okay. Do it again. Doesn't seem to like it when I go that way. Well, what's up with you? Try it one more time. I think I heard a backfire. Yeah, something's. It would have to be this because the crank sensor is just set. It is what it is. 
it would have to be this. We might be 180 out. I thought we weren't though. Let me recheck my cam timing here. Something's up with the ignition timing, I believe. I can't believe it started first time. That was, <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's surprising, wasn't it? <laughs> I must have guessed right on some stuff. You did great. I remember we tried to start the LTD wagon. Mm. It took about a week or so it to get it all worked out. Well, that's true. I unhooked the crank and cam sensor signal again. We're going to bump it over. All right, just barely bump it, Ralph. Again. More. All right, I'm starting to get compression. All right, let's do this process again. Turn the key off. Right there, I think. Well, according to this, it looks like we're still dead on. That's confusing. What would make it not run right? I mean, our injectors, are they working right? They, they was running fine before. Did we mess them up, put them in the ultrasonic cleaner? They were still clicking when they came out though. We've got new plugs in it, same wires, new cap, rotor. I just remember we didn't cap off any of the vacuum ports. Hmm. So if it yeah. didn't get a correct vacuum signal to the map sensor, if it didn't show the vacuum, it would give it too much fuel. I bet our vacuum leaks are messing with us. Do I need to go get vacuum caps or what? Yeah, get some vacuum caps. We did this last time back. too. Yeah, we always get in a hurry and forget those things. Last time it went... Classic. Classic. Every well, we don't know it fixed it yet. Don't rush to judgment here. I'm just saying, we didn't do it last time either. Two massive ones here. Yeah, that, that probably has What's supposed to go in it? Don't we need to put the correct thing in it? Hey, will we'll these fit on the massive ones? They're, Those are the biggest ones we have. They're more massive than that. Why don't we fix it with how it's supposed to be fixed? <laughs> Well, I honestly just forgot about them. But well, I mean, what goes there? I don't know. Whatever I want to go on. Back you're here. supposed to know these things. Yeah, here's some. One here to cap. Okay, that's good. Now we got two huge ones right there. Wait, can we get it again? Huge. Can we get a three zero on the camera? Hey, huge ones right there. What's with him and the 3X zoom on everything? It's hilarious. Looks like I need a 3 8 hose and I can just loop them back around each other. Mm -hmm. Well, once you go to the brake booster though, really. Oh yeah, no. some brakes would be good. Pull that through. All right, that's good. I'm hooking this up to the brake booster out here, which like my wife said is where it was supposed to go in the first place. So, I capped this one off in the side of the keg here. The other one is going up to the brake booster. Those were our two huge leaks right there. I capped that small one off there. I think that's all. I can't find any more. So we're gonna try it again. All right, mom thinks we need the breather on it. So there you go, mom. <laughs> we never hooked the crank thing to back up. <laughs> Classic. Well, right, where are we? <laughs> all right, let's try it again with the crank signal. Shut off for it's when you gas it. It's running better, yeah. Do you think it's the lack of an oil pressure signal? I know some of these have security features, but it's called a skim system where it detects the key. But everything I'd researched said that ours didn't have security because we had a black key and there was no ring around the key, so I'm, I don't think that's it. Why are you cranking up and down? You try to start it, Wall. Does it have any oil pressure? Yeah, it does. It has fuel pressure. Yeah, it has fuel pressure, it has oil pressure. I thought for sure it's because we hooked all those vacuum lines. Well, it sounds to run better when it runs. I agree. It's hitting some sort of safety and turning itself off, it sounds like to me. <laughs> now it's not even trying. I bet if you unhook the battery and hook it back up, it would start again for a couple times. We will try. We're gonna try mom's idea. We'll let it sit here a few minutes. Man, I'm getting hot. I was really hoping it just run and run good. We need to hook up a scan tool to it and see what it's saying. She's already hoarded up in here, gonna lay another egg. That one's from yesterday. I don't know why she wants to lay in the shop on this little mat over here. When she has a hen house with hay and, oh, she's gonna, she's gonna get it under and he's protecting her. We let the battery sit on the hook, so we're gonna try it again here. Why won't it even try now? I 
Okay. So what's up with you? Let me hook my scan tool up to it and see what it says. How cool is that? It's talking to our 74 Dodge here. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. I've never had a car where I had an OBD2 port on it like this. I mean, that's cool. Not so bad mechanic. Probably. Bad wiring person. She has a picture, my picture pops up. EXT ambient temp sensor. I don't think we even hooked up the ambient temp sensor at all. Should we have? It might. I didn't think it would reference anything with that because it should only reference the manifold air temperature. Is I that thought. the only thing? Well, we're tracing down wires, trying to find the ambient temp sensor wires because we have the sensor and the wires, but from the factory, the ambient temp sensor goes all the way into the fuse box under the dash. So it has no connection to this directly. It goes into the car and then back out. Out. The wires that come back out, which is these wires, there's no wire that matches that color. That's why I didn't use the ambient temp sensor. I haven't found anything for sure yet. I can't find any wiring diagrams that show it either. In the harness that comes from the computer out to here, which is our only options that would be these wires, there's four wires that aren't hooked up. And I have no idea what any of them are. So we have two black and white ones. I don't think that's it. And then we have a black. Is it black? It's it a, could be purple. Mm -hmm. Could have been purple. So we're thinking these are it. Because look, they match our colors pretty good. So this is green stripe, green stripe. I think it is purple. I think, it I is. think it's faded out. Yeah, that's what I said. I thought it was purple. Well, this was under the dash. This was under the hood. So that makes oh. sense. And then we have black with a blue stripe. So we're going to hook up our ambient temp sensor to these. And maybe that will delete that code out. So I believe that is our sensor ground wire. And this is our signal wire back to the ECU, I believe. What is your deal, bird? We have the noisiest bird in the country. You as bad as the guineas. Burnt purple threw me off. We couldn't find that one for nothing. So now this will get an outside temperature reading. If we hooked it up right, we'll see if that makes any difference at all. I came up here and tried to move some stuff for her to have room on her mat that she decided. And then she decided right here was a better place for it. So It's still giving me that code. So I'm gonna erase the code. So now it's erasing the code out of the computer. It's successfully erased. Let's see what it says now on the codes. It's still saying the same thing. I'm gonna try to start it here again, see what happens. I guess we're gonna have to get back to the basics. We're gonna have to check fuel, check spark. We know we have fuel pressure, but is it actually spraying fuel? I think I'm gonna start there. Try this old school way. Go ahead, Ralph. You let off too soon. Go ahead. Jesus, Woo! Lord. Woo! <laughs> My ears are ringing. So it's definitely got spark. But it looks like it's a fuel issue. <sighs> My heart stopped. Just like the last one. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't starting out good. <laughs> a little too soon there, Wawa. Too soon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll take it back. Try to crank it. Try it again. So it's got voltage to them. So the computer sends it a ground signal to ground these. Try to crank it. Now right there, it's not showing any signal, but this thing's not super sensitive either. Let's try to crank it again on this bottle and see if it'll run for a while. And if there's trash in there, maybe we'll get out of the fuel. It ain't wanting to do nothing, is it? No. It sounds like timing, especially when it's backfiring like that. Our firing order's correct. We checked our firing order. Our crank sensor location is set. So the only thing that's adjustable is the cam sensor and the distributor here. We moved it around. That didn't seem to matter. I mean, the only code we're getting is ambient temp sensor. There's an auto shutdown relay. Let me make sure it's not shutting me down. <laughs> It's showing power the whole time it's cranking. The auto shutdown relay is turned on, which turns on your cool and fuel injectors and all that stuff. There's a lot of work in this to run into a wall like this. We really need somebody, a scan tool that can delete out security codes and stuff because I'm afraid it's a security code that's getting us. That's what I'm afraid of. Is that something that you guys have the ability to delete out of the tube? I've called five different places. 
local tuners and even the Dodge dealership. And I've got nowhere. One guy said he might maybe could do it, but then we started matching up computer numbers and the numbers I had didn't match what he was able to tune. So I'm kind of dead in the water right now. I really expected this thing to continue running after it started up and ran. I don't know what to do now. Honestly, I'm kind of stuck. I think I'm gonna have to spend some time researching and maybe call some friends and see if they know anybody. We're gonna go into research mode now. So it was at this point after a few hours of whining and moping and searching online and calling everybody I knew, I called one guy that was sent me to another guy that was sent me to another guy that basically told me they couldn't help me. So I'm going to go to Harbor Freight and get a Noid light because I don't own one, which that's a little tiny light that takes the place of your fuel injector and it will flash and tell you if your computer is pulsing and sending a signal to your injectors because it definitely seems like the basis of our problem is a fuel problem because if I put gas down, it fires. Maybe the pre-filters and the injectors are stopped up or maybe the security system is just shut off the injector. So we're going to go get this Noid light and figure out if the injectors are still pulsing. And we're about to run out of dates, today. This place just takes all my money. Is that the right thing? I think so. <laughs> At least you found it. I couldn't find it nowhere. I got it plugged into my injector. So this should flash on and off if it's getting a signal. Crank it over, Ralph. It's not doing anything there. Okay. Looks like we're not getting a signal from our injectors now. So why would we have had a signal and now we don't have a signal so our injectors aren't firing which makes me think security stuff i've literally spent the last few hours reading and reading and researching and basically guys are saying certain newer cars you have like a body control module so it has to have that to function but supposedly in the 99 model the only options are it could have security and it could not if it has security sometimes it'll start and die start and die which is what ours was doing for a little bit and now it just won't even start anymore it'd be almost funny if we bolted a carburetor on there now since we have spark <laughs> that'd be funny they do offer computers that have the security stuff deleted out of them i found a company in florida that sells those so maybe that's an option but then we're waiting you know and we're down to the wire here i've got to do more research and call some more people it just so happens that this is Friday night. So everybody I call was right at closing time Friday and they're not open again till Monday. So it looks like we're going to have to maybe spend some time doing some research and wait until Monday to call. I don't know what else to try. I mean, it's not firing injectors. That don't make a lot of sense to me why it wouldn't. It must be getting an RPM signal because it's telling the fuel pump to run and it's also sparking. So we know we're getting an RPM signal. We'll get back with you as soon as we have the next thing to try. So it's two days later and i have been reading and researching and trying everything i checked it a couple different ways plugged in a random injector i knew was good it won't click so a friend of mine let me borrow this diagnostic tool and it's old but it's you know it works so i scanned it to see what computer it is and this says it's for a 99 jeep with a 5.2 liter so somebody has swapped the computer I looked all over the Durango out there to see if it had the skim system, the security system, and it does not. So I'm like, well, we're good. But what if the Jeep did? I'm wondering if the people swap computers on this Durango trying to fix something, and now that's messed me all up. So I'm thinking I'm going to have to get a new computer and try it. They make computers that delete out the skim system, and I think I'm going to have to do that. It even says Canadian module, so I'm really confused. This is interesting here. I don't know why this scan tool didn't show these other codes. But see, it's showing fuel sending unit voltage too high, which we don't have a fuel sending unit connected to it. No cluster bus message. So the CAN bus system not communicating with the cluster because there is no cluster in this thing. The ambient battery temp sensor voltage too high because I didn't wire the battery temp sensor in, which I wouldn't think that would matter. And then the EVAP solenoid, which was plugged in here, which I unhooked, it's disconnected so all those make sense they should be there but nothing that should keep it from running i wouldn't think so i'm going to clear those codes see if that makes any difference at all let's try an actuator test can we fire the injectors from here you think oh here we go let's fire injector hear that so that means our injector driver is good okay so it's not burn up injector drivers we're getting somewhere 
It's got to be security stuff. It's got to be. I bet it's the old swaparoo on the computer that got us. So now it's 13 days from the beginning of this video. And there was other videos filmed. And we have finally received our computer that has all the security features flashed out of it. And we are really, really hoping that this fixes it. I am uh, kind of out of ideas here. We've checked all this wiring again. It's been a lot of diagnosing stuff that's went on in the background that just isn't worth filming so we went through and taped up the end of every wire looped it around and taped it so there's nothing that's going to arc on anything because i was worried maybe something arced on something we got our computer here so it's completely rebuilt and it has sand in it what yeah let me show you the bag it came in are you kidding me this is like my drawers after i come off the beach there's sand all inside this bag oh so i guess they sandblast the cases and they just left a little in there for me i guess you did that, Nintendo. Oh, yeah. You were there. We're going to plug this bad boy in and pray to the good Lord that it runs because I'm out of options, but I double-checked. This does have the correct VIN number for our vehicle, so they programmed the correct VIN number in. It's supposed to have all the security features for the skim system flashed out of it. It's for a 5.9, not a 5.2. It's for a Dodge, not a Jeep, which I know those are kind of the same thing, but still. I don't know what stuff mattered and what stuff didn't, but we're about to see if any of it mattered. Maybe none of it mattered. If this don't work, we may have to pursue other options on the engine control computer. Hey, you've given it a good effort, though. Either way, I'm just going to yeah. say you went above and beyond well, what any man should have done. Uh, well, let's put it this way. You put out a video every six days, and it takes you 13 days to film it. So now all I need is a time machine. <laughs> you hear the grittiness? It's like a sand. There you go. Black, white, gray. Please work. So it says to hook the battery up, turn the key on, and leave it on for five minutes without it running, and turn it off, and then try it. It prime the pump, so the ECU's doing things. The clock starts now. A few moments later. Time's up. Here goes nothing. Man. Man, oh man. Why? Pump's priming. Same problem. Get our annoyed light back out. Let's see, is it getting a, a signal to the injector? Same problem, guys. And it didn't even try. Usually they say if it's a security thing, it'll start up like, I've even seen the exact number, seven times. Well, I guess I'm whipped. I don't know what to tell you. Upon doing more research, it seems like I would have been better off to get a 95 and older OBD1. Would have not had any security features for sure, but we got a computer without it and it's not starting. That is very puzzling. That's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. And this is not the way I want to end this video off because I fully expected that it would start up and run. You know, all the little stuff I've done research, guys were like, oh, you hook up three or four wires, it's no big deal, it runs. It ran for a little bit. We're getting no injector signal. So I guess the point of this video now is we need your help. Somebody out there that really knows their stuff on these, they can tell me why it is not pulsing the injectors because I'm kind of stuck right now. I know I could pull all this off and, and do uh, like a Holly Terminator X and run it. I know how to do that. And I've done swaps like this before and not had this problem. So just never done a Dodge Magnum one. So let us know in the comments what might be wrong because I don't know what's wrong with it. I've traced every wire and every plug and made sure everything had power and I don't understand how it's getting spark. It's getting everything it needs except for an injector pulse signal now. I don't know what to do, but this is not looking good for us taking a summer trip, unfortunately. I guess this is where we're gonna end it off, guys. I know it's kind of a not so typical ending, not on a high note, but we did get a lot of wiring done and we got it all put in here it's not working maybe we just don't have good luck with rvs we'll get it figured out whether we figure it out with this computer or we end up swapping to something else i hate to start over because i'd have to redo the whole engine harness if we did something different but that may be what we have to do to get it running i know my injector drivers are good i know my wires coming out of the computer are good i know my injectors are working i don't know i know i have fuel pressure i guess this is the end of this one so we will see you guys in the next video hopefully we'll know what's wrong with this thing here in the next few weeks and be able to do something with it we're hoping but check out our second channel sleeper 
Dude 2. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Sleeper Dude 88. We may have to plan for a fall trip. We may have to. Or a winter trip. We may. Or next summer. <laughs> Yeah, we appreciate you guys watching. It really helps out. Sorry it ended this way, but I put in 13 days of work to get to this point, and I just can't work on any more in this video. <laughs> and let us know if you have any for sure answers. Yeah. yeah, if you know what's wrong with it, if it's obvious to you and not obvious to me, let me know, because I don't know everything. And, what? Uh, you don't? Nope. And we'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye! Bye!